When I think of all my faults and all my failures, when I consider all the times I let God down, I am humbled by the grace He has extended, and I'm amazed at the mercy I have found. I could never earn His love on my own, yet every time I come before His throne, I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I stand redeemed before the great I Am. When He looks at me, tonight in Luke chapter 16. If you have a Bible, Luke chapter 16. If not, you can look on with a friend or I'll read the verses for you tonight. I stand redeemed. That word redeemed has the idea of being a ransom. You know what a ransom is? And somebody gets held hostage and they demand you pay something to get them out. Uh, you and I were held hostage by sin, but thankfully Jesus Christ is willing to shed his blood on the cross to pay our ransom so that you and I can be redeemed and set free. Luke chapter 16 tonight, thank you for being here in your place. How many would say this is the first time I've ever been to this church? I'm a visitor, first time. Any like that? Good, a few of you. Well, thank you for coming. We are glad to have you here and hope that you'll be with us again tomorrow night. We got Thursday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday. We got something special planned on Friday that you won't want to miss. So Luke chapter 16 in your Bible. And as you turn there, uh, let me say this. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was with some friends in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, that my friend is a preacher friend. And he said, hey, last year we went to Haiti in January. And he said, next, this upcoming January, we're going to go back to Haiti. He said, would you like to join us? I said, let me, let, me, let, me, let me check my schedule. And I got my calendar out, and the schedule was free. And I said, yeah, I would love to, uh, to go with you. I've never been there before. I'd love to go. And so after we put it on the calendar and agreed to go and got it scheduled, I started asking them questions. Uh, I'd never been to Haiti, so I started asking questions like, well, uh, what's Haiti like? What are the people like? What's the food like? I mean, what, what's the weather like? Tell me about it. And uh, the best way to figure out what a place is like if you've never been there is to interview someone that has been there. Would you agree with that? And tonight I want to uh, uh, show you, preach to you uh, about a place in the Bible, watch it now, that nobody wants to go to. 
Though millions have gone there, and millions more will go there. I want to preach about a place called hell tonight in the Bible. I want to preach a message entitled, Interviews from Hell. Interviews from Hell. Notice the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse number 19, the Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared or ate sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And so there's two men in our story tonight, this, this account that Jesus tells us. It was a rich man and a poor man. And the Bible says of the poor man, and he was desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. We'd understand that to mean heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. Jesus introduces us to two men here. One was a rich man and one was the poor man. The Bible does not tell us what the rich man's name was but the Bible does tell us the name of the poor man. His name uh, was, uh, was Lazarus. And these two men lived lives that were polar opposite. One man uh, lived in a mansion. He had a purple clothing. That was a fine linen in that day. Cost a lot of money. He ate anything that he wanted to. Uh, the poor man Lazarus was the exact opposite. The Bible says that he was late at his gate. The Bible says that the dogs came and licked his sores. He begged for the crumbs which fell uh, from the rich man's table. And yet you continue reading and both of those men died and surprisingly it was the rich man who died and went to hell and it was the poor man who died and went to heaven. Hey look it, when it's all said and done, it's not about what you have, it's about who you have. One man had Jesus and one man did not have Jesus. Tonight if we could pull the rich man out of hell, by the way 2,000 years later he's still there. If we could pull him up out of hell tonight, use your imagination and bring him to the Crossroads Baptist Church to the teen extravaganza 2017, I would ask him this question in our interview tonight. I would ask him this question, what is hell like? And I believe on this passage right here, he would give us three quick answers. He would say, number one, hell is an actual place. Hell is an actual place. In fact, notice the Bible says in verse number 23, and in hell. Hell, he lift up his eyes. Look right here. Hell's not a cuss word. Hell's not a word to describe the weather in the summer. Hell is not a joke. Hell is a real place with real people. You say, I don't know about all that. You say, I think I'd like to hear the preaching of Jesus a whole lot better. I don't think you would. Do you realize that Jesus preached more on hell than he ever did about heaven in the Bible? Mark it down. Hell is an actual place. The story is told of a young man who got saved. He became a Christian and he started to get concerned about the young people he went to school with, his classmates. He went back to school and attempted to tell them about Jesus and how they could be saved. They started making fun of him and, and started giving him a hard time and the subject of hell was brought up and one of those young men asked that young man a question. They said, if hell is a real place, then where is it at? Well, that young man, just a new Christian, he hesitated for a moment, and then he said this. He said, hell is at the end of a Christless life. You can mark it down, hell is real. You say, I don't believe in a place called hell. You will one day, but it'll be too late. Hell is an actual place. Number two, hell is an awful place. He would say hell is an awful place. And from that point on in Luke chapter 16, the, the, the Bible really pulls back the curtain and gives us a glimpse of what is hell, uh, what a hell is like. And it is an awful place. You say, what makes hell uh, so awful? The Bible says in verse number 24, the last phrase, the man says, for I am tormented in this flame. I am tormented in this flame. Hey, hell is a place of fire. My wife has a relative on her side of the family. He's a police officer, and not just a policeman, he's a helicopter policeman. So he flies, and they live there in uh, Amarillo, Texas. Two summers ago, there was a, uh, the railroad in Amarillo, Texas made an error. And somehow, one of the trains got going in the wrong direction. It took one of the wrong tracks, and now two trains were barreling towards each other. Uh, both of them slammed on their brakes, but you understand it, it takes it's a long time for a train to come to a stop. They both collided head on. In one of the trains, there was one conductor. In the other train, there was two conductors. The train that had one conductor on it, he was killed immediately upon impact. The other two men survived. 
They called 911 and said, you got to help us out. We've been in a train accident. Would you please get someone here uh, to get us out? The dispatch at 911 said, we're sending the firefighters. They are on their way. A few moments later, the train caught on fire. They said, you got to hurry. The, 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 the train is on fire now. You please, please send somebody fast. Please send somebody quick. Finally, the firefighters got there and they brought the jaws of life with them. That's what they use to, to tear people out of cars that have been in accidents. They put the jaws of life onto that train, but unfortunately the metal on that train was so thick that the jaws of life could not rip uh, uh, the, the train walls open and the door to get to those men. And at that point, as the flames begin to fill that train, all the 911 dispatch could do was forward those two men to their wives' cell phones. And those two women comforted their husbands as they perished in the flames. Fortunately for those men, the suffering came to an end. But you listen to me, if you die without Christ, the flames will never come to an end. Hell is a place of fire. Listen to me, it's an awful place. It's not just a place of fire. He says in verse number 24, He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Listen to me. He never got one drop of water and neither will you if you die and go to hell. Listen, it's a place of unquenchable thirst. There's no water in hell. There's no drinks in hell. It's an awful place, young people. It's also a place of, uh, of memory. The Bible says in verse number 25, But Abraham said unto him, Son, remember... Remember, you know what you're going to have in hell if you die without Christ? You're going to have a memory in hell. You say, what kind of things am I going to remember in hell? I think you'll remember every time that you came to a church like this and a youth rally like this and a man got up and preached the Bible and said, trust Christ before it's too late. Get saved before it's too late. But you stiff-armed God and you said no to Jesus and you walked out of here and you missed your opportunity to be saved. I believe that memory is going to haunt you with regret for all of eternity. Mark it down, you're going to have a memory in hell. It's an awful place. It's not just a place of fire and unquenchable thirst. It's also a place that's forever. It's a place forever. The Bible says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Look at when you die, listen, there's no purgatory, there's no soul sleep, there's no uh, reincarnation, uh, there's no second tries, there's no redos. When you die, that is it. And if you die without Christ, you'll go to hell, and you'll be there forever. You don't get out. You don't do your time. There's no redos. There's no second chances. If you die without Christ, you'll be there for all of eternity. Young person, he would say, number one, hell's an actual place. Number two, hell is an awful place. But praise God, number three, he would say, hell is an avoidable place. Hell is an avoidable place. He goes on to say this in verse 27. He says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. In other words, the rich man cried out to Abraham and said, Abraham, would you send Lazarus to my daddy's house? You say, why would he want uh, uh, Lazarus to go to his daddy's house? It says in verse 28, For I have five brethren. Oh, he still had five brothers living at, at, at dad's house back home. He says, send him to my dad's house that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. In other words, he says, I don't want my brothers to come here. I don't want my families to come to this place called hell. Would you send somebody to tell them so that they don't come to this place called hell? But notice what Abraham sends back to him. He says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. They have Moses and the prophets. You say, what in the world does that mean? Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament and the prophets wrote the rest. Here's what he's saying. He says they have everything they need to keep them from coming to this place called hell. You say, what keeps you from going to hell? Owning a copy of the Bible? No, it's believing the message of the Bible that keeps you from going to hell. You say, what's the message of the Bible? Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. For God so loved the world. That's you, that's me, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, to die on a cross, to shed his blood, to be buried and rose again, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and go to hell, but have everlasting life. There's two people in this room today, those that are on their way to heaven and those that are on their way to hell. And depending on what you've done with Jesus will determine where you spend eternity. The Bible says, he that hath the son hath life. 
He that hath not the Son hath not life. There's two types of people in here, those who have the Son and those who do not have the Son. Can I ask you tonight, do you have the Son? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know that if you were to die right now, that you would go to heaven? Or are you concerned that you may go to hell? Years ago, there's a, there's a story told of a Russian nomadic tribe. And this was a, a very strict tribe. They had very strict laws and harsh punishments if you broke the law. And one day, the people of that tribe came to the Indian chief. He was a very large man, strong man. And they said, chief, somebody's been stealing our things. There's things missing from our, uh, from our huts. Someone's been stealing our things. And so the Indian chief gathered everybody around and warned them. He says, the man that is caught stealing will receive ten lashes from the whip. He thought, surely that'll put an end to it. A couple days later, they came back and said, chief, you won't believe it. Someone is still stealing the things that belong to us. There's a thief in here. He gathered everybody back again. And he said, this time the man that is caught stealing will re receive 20 lashes from the whip. A couple days later, it happened again. They came back to the Indian chief and said, chief, it happened again. Somebody has stolen our things. He gathered them together one more time and said, now the man that is caught stealing will receive 30 lashes. Listen, the only one who could withstand 30 lashes of the whip was the chief himself. That was a death sentence to anyone else. A few days later, the tribe erupted. They began running to the chief and said, we've caught the thief. We caught the thief. We caught the thief. He said, bring him to me. They brought the chief, the, the, that thief to the chief and they said, show me who it is. And they lifted the, 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 the thief up and it was his own mother. All of a sudden the crowd was split and the tribe of people began to question, what is he going to do? And surely he won't punish his own mother. I mean, it's his own mother. Is the law going to win or will his love win? Finally, the chief announced what he was going to do. And he says, my mother will receive 30 lashes from the whip. He said, the law's the law. They took his mother. They wrapped his, her arms around a tree. They exposed her back. And as that whip master took that whip, and he brought it up. And just before he brought it down across her back, the chief said, wait a second. And the chief stepped forward and he took the robe off his back. And there he wrapped his loving arms around his mother. And there took all 30 lashes from the whip, from the crimes that his mother committed. Listen to me. That's exactly what Jesus did for you on the cross. Look into me. God is a holy God. And because he's holy, he must punish sin. But he's also a God of love. And because he loves you, he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to the cross. And Jesus took the punishment for the sins that you committed how many is thankful for Calvary and the cross and what Jesus did for you he took your lashes on the cross sir what is hell like oh it's an actual place it's an awful place but praise God it's an avoidable place because of Jesus there's three other men that we know of in the Bible who died without Jesus Christ and I would like to pull all three of those men to our meeting tonight and ask him just one question and I want, I want to get their different answers on this one question. And that question is this, why are you in hell? Why are you in hell? Now look, we understand people go to hell because they reject Jesus. They say no to Jesus. They don't trust Jesus. They either outright say no to Jesus or they put their trust in baptism. That won't get you to heaven. They trust in being a church member. That sure won't get you to heaven. They trust giving money to the church. That won't get you to heaven. Only a relationship with Jesus will get you to heaven. If we could pull the first man out of hell, we would talk to this man, Judas. You say, Brother Taylor, Judas, that was one of the 12 disciples. I mean, that was the man who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus. He heard the preaching of Jesus. He saw the miracles. He, he, he saw the ministry of Jesus. One of the 12 disciples, look at it, he's in hell today. If we could pull him out of hell and say, Judas, why are you in hell tonight? He would say this. Because I wasn't real. He would say, because I wasn't real. Look, at, I'm not trying to make anybody doubt their salvation tonight. But there may be somebody here you know in your heart you're not saved. But you know the right things to say. 
You know the right things to do. You know how to you know how to sing the songs and you can say amen and you can look right and dress right, you can play the part, but you know in your heart that you've never been truly saved. Look at you can fool your mom and dad, you can fool your friends, you can fool your preacher, but you're not gonna fool God one day. And if there's someone here that's been playing the games, you need to stop playing the games tonight and take the mask off. Show is over. And you need to come and truly trust Jesus as your personal Savior tonight. Why are you in hell? Because I wasn't real. Bring a person, it's not worth it. If you know in your heart that you're not saved, then tonight you need to get saved. The second man we would pull out of hell tonight and ask him, why are you there, is King Felix. It's King Felix. His story is told in Acts chapter 24. And Paul is standing before King Felix. And everywhere the apostle Paul went, he was always telling somebody about Jesus. Now he's standing before a king. And yet boldly and unashamedly, he's witnessing to that king and telling King Felix about a Jesus Christ. And in Acts 24, the Bible says that Felix began to listen to the gospel. And uh, he heard what Jesus had done for, the, uh, for him. And the Bible says he began to reason those things. And watch it now. The Bible says he began to tremble. King Felix began to tremble. He was under conviction. He knew that he was lost. He knew that Jesus Christ was Savior. God was dealing with his heart. But here's what King Felix said back to Paul. He said, when I have a more convenient season, I will send for thee. He says, when I have a more convenient season, I will send for thee. If we were to say, King Felix, why are you in hell tonight? He would say this, watch it now. Because I wasn't ready. Because I wasn't ready. King Felix, would you like to be saved? Why don't you trust Christ? Here's what he said later. Later. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it later. Listen to me. Later neighbor came for him. There may be somebody here tonight. God is dealing with your heart. And you need to get saved tonight. And you say, I think I'll do that later. Watch it. Listen to me very carefully. You do not get saved when you're ready to get saved. You get saved when God's ready for you to be saved. The Bible says, no man, no man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. In other words, you don't just wake up one day and think, well, I guess I'll get saved today. It doesn't work like that. It's only when God begins to work in your heart and to draw you and to tug on your heart. And he shows you that you're lost. And he shows you that you're on your way to hell. But he convinces you that Jesus Christ is the only one to be that can save you and it's at that moment that you can be saved and only in that moment tonight if you're here and God is dealing with your heart don't you put that decision off until tomorrow a lot of young people will come to a service like this and hear the gospel and they'll say tomorrow tomorrow listen tomorrow's the date on the fool's calendar the Bible says boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The Bible says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Young person, you may leave out of here tonight, and you may get in your car to go home, and you may never make it home. You could be involved in an accident tonight, and your life could be taken, and you missed your opportunity. Young person, if God's dealing with your heart tonight, don't you put that decision off until tomorrow or later, because you may not have tomorrow, and you may not have later. If you're here tonight and need to get saved, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. Do it tonight. I'm begging you, don't put it off till later. King Felix, why are you in hell tonight? Because I wasn't ready. Notice lastly, the last question we'll ask the last man. It would be King Agrippa. King Agrippa, his story is told in Acts chapter 26 and verse number 28. And once again, Paul stands before him and he's witnessing and he's sharing Christ with King Agrippa. And he says, King Agrippa, I know that thou believest. And here's what King Agrippa said back to him. He, watch it now. He says, Paul, almost, almost, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. King Agrippa, why are you in hell tonight? He would say this, because I didn't respond. Because I didn't respond. He would say I was that close. I wonder how many young people are in hell tonight because they came to a service just like this. The Bible was preached. The gospel was presented. And as the music began to play from the invitation, it was time to come forward and be saved. Oh, they would say, I almost stepped out. I almost went forward. I almost went back and met with a counselor and let them show me from the Bible. I almost made that decision, but I didn't. And because I did not respond, I'm in hell tonight. Young person, one day you are going to die. In fact, a hundred years from now, every person in this room, you will either be in heaven or you will be in hell. And it all depends on what you do 
with Jesus. Can I ask you tonight, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? If you don't, then let's tonight get it settled. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking on. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking on. If you're here tonight and say, Preacher, Preacher, I'm just being honest. If I were to die right now, after hearing what I just heard, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Preacher, I don't know that I'm going to heaven. Preacher, no one's ever taken a Bible and showed me how to be saved. But tonight God is dealing with my heart. I would like to trust Jesus as my personal Savior. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I put it high enough that I can see it. I see this hand. Anybody else? Anybody? I see this hand. Thank you for your courage. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I've never made that opportunity. I've never t- uh, made that decision before. Listen, no one can make that decision for you. Your mom can't make that decision. Your friend can't make that decision. Only you can make that decision. And friend, it's as simple as asking Jesus Christ into your heart. And tonight, if you would call on him, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you would call upon him tonight and ask him to save you, he would come into your heart, forgive you of your sin, and you can leave out of here tonight knowing that you're on your way to heaven. You'll never have to fear going to hell again because your sins have been forgiven. One more time tonight, if you like, you say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven. I'm concerned about that. Would you raise your hand one more time tonight? I see this hand. I see this hand. I see that hand. Three hands. Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And then when I say amen, I see this hand. I, when I pray, I'm going to have us all stand to our feet. As soon as I say amen, we're going to stand. And as soon as you stand to your feet, the piano will begin playing. And if you raise your hand tonight saying, I need to get it say, I need to get that settled. I want to talk to somebody. We are going to have men and women in the back. They're counselors. They have Bibles. And they will sit down with you and show you from the Bible how to receive Jesus Christ. Friend, if you need to make that decision, I'm pleading with you, make it tonight. Father, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Would you stand to your